Take it over there. Won't be a par well, <laughs> not not a parable really, but thank okay. you for the the reference. I would like to introduce my my longtime friend and colleague Russ Vane, who is my co-author on this, and I have to read his title off here. He's, he's at the National Risk Management Center, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency within the Department of Homeland Security, which we hope is one of those little islands of competence in that cesspool. <laughs> Tell us how you and really feel of course, about it's an island of confidence because he's in it. It's too kind. <laughs> Which is too kind? That it's an island of confidence? <laughs> All right. Moving right along, some of you may have heard of this classic paper years ago the garbage, a garbage can model of organizational choice, Cohen, March, and Olson. They said that the decision processes in a lot of organizations look as if all of the problems and all the solutions to problems got dumped into one big garbage can. And whenever a solution happens at random to meet up with a problem, then the problem gets solved. And there's no more structure to it than that. It's organizational anarchy. They did kind of a toy simulation where it sort of worked. But people really believe the garbage can model. There's, there was no theoretical support for it. There was no real empirical support for it. Nobody ever went out to a real organization and tested it. But it just kind of intuitively felt right to a lot of people who knew about organizations, and this became a classic in the field. Oh, you guys mentioned Doug. I think that there was, at the Stanford Business School about 10 years ago, a guy named Mo, Terry Mo, I think, re implemented Michael's original code. And, uh, You're getting ahead. <laughs> You're getting ahead. In 2006, oh, what is this thing doing to me? I hit the wrong key somewhere. And it doesn't realize I want full screen. I click on your screen again and see whether, no, it doesn't. Hmm. Interesting, because this is being recorded. <coughs> Bingo. Where is it? All right. So, in 2006, it happened that the computational uh, social science group, Casos, I think it was at that time, met jointly with Swarmfest, which is sponsored out of uh, Santa Fe Institute. It was just one day of overlap. <coughs> so, I was presenting at CMOT Casos, whatever it was called at that time. There was this paper on the overlap day from the Swarmfest people about how a lymph node works. These people have done an agent-based model of how cancer, how, how a lymph node deals with cancer. What happens is in your bloodstream there are cells that identify foreign objects and foreign substances. They drag them to lymph nodes. And lymph nodes are full of these specialized cells that can handle all kinds of foreign objects and foreign organisms. And if you get a whole bunch of unresolved invaders in, in your body, your body just generates a whole bunch of specialized killer cells, hoping that some of them will be appropriately matched to the invading organism. If you've ever gotten sick and you got a swelling here, swelling here, down in your groin, those are your lymph nodes. And the reason they're swollen is that they're full of these added cells the body is generating to try to get rid of the invader. Well, that looked an awful lot to me when I saw it like the garbage can model. With the added feature, that now we have a downsizing feature. And when, when the crisis is passed, this organization downsizes. It sells other cells, sends other cells to go and tap those killer cells. Hey, guy, you're done out of here. So that led to the idea that maybe what gets thrown into the garbage can is not sol solutions with some kinds of energies to them, the way Cohen, March, and Olson set it up, but solvers with skill sets. Problems require a certain set of skills. 
Solvers have a certain set of skills. When a solver with the right skill set meets an appropriate problem, that's when the problem gets solved. So I was tossing that idea around. I went over to uh, Germany and took the one week agent-based modeling and simulation class from uh, Gilbert and Troitsch and was looking at this as a project for myself. And I didn't get very far with it, but Troitsch did. He did some work in which he said, okay, let's look at matchups on skills. He had a way of portraying what the skill set looks like. And there's an angle. If the angle in, in the solver matches the angle in the, the problem, then the problem gets solved very efficiently. Obviously, different metrics of how that matchup works can change the result. Anyway, he wrote about it. And it turns out getting the, a mix of skilled workers, maybe less skilled but with a more diverse set of skills, may actually work better than having a few superstars that can solve everything. So, you know, echoes Scott Page's work on diversity trumps ability. This is especially true of a situation where what you're trying to do is respond to unknowns. Unknowns are getting thrown at you. The, the way that I've explained Page's work to people is if you have the sweet street sweeper on your team, you will waste a lot of time explaining stuff to him that he doesn't understand. He doesn't help you very much. Until the day you come in and the question of the day is how do we clean up after the parade? And all your financial experts may not know that, but that street sweeper does. You can do variations on this, different approaches to supervision, uh, matchmaking by the organization rather than at random, different metrics of effectiveness and cost effectiveness. Troich talks about skills matches, but then he doesn't talk about how some sol solvers would have much higher cost than others. So maybe you want a less skilled solver that happens to match the problem but doesn't cost as much. And then how do you determine that? How do you determine how much benefit you got from solving problems? There's a lot you can do, and he, he was doing some work on team formation. There was some later work, published a few years later, where he went further with the model, the team formation. I've been trying to get the updated version of that model from him or anybody else and have not managed to do so. I do have the code that he used for the work in 2008 with the skills matching. So, Doug, what does the lymph node system do once it, it has effectively fought an infection and... Um, it has to, and it downsizes. It kills the solvers. It does not kill all the solvers. It doesn't kill all the solvers, but it kills Why doesn't it kill all the solvers? <laughs> doesn't kill, yeah. I, I checked yeah. with the biologist, because obviously as we mm -hmm. were working on mm -hmm. this, I thought it would be nice to know. It turns out that, that be a it, very it reduces the number of solvers down to about six or eight. So those guys get tenure. Okay, that should be a funny. <laughs> okay, they get tenure. And what happens is the body is ready to explode with a thousand-fold growth mm -hmm. of the tenured faculty when they see the same dangerous element again. Mm -hmm. So that's the mechanism that the body has essentially for vaccination, is once you've solved that problem, you keep a little bit, a few cells ready in the lymph node system to go at it again. Yeah. Next. So, the garbage can model, as modified, gives us a very rich representation of how to assess organizational effectiveness and improve it. It's another case of uh, self-similarity. You've got something going on at the cellular level. It also describes pretty well what goes on at the macro organization level. It illuminates how to improve cybersecurity by a more effective team response because cybersecurity is an interesting challenge. What's going on in cybersecurity? What do you think is the biggest single cybersecurity risk we face? Users. Sorry, what? Users. Not quite. <laughs> Not quite. Close. Doug Hubbard says it's, we're measuring cybersecurity in, in risk incorrectly. 
Doug Hubbard has got has got a whole franchise going in this how to measure anything area. But what he's saying is if you don't know what risk you're trying to assess, it's really, really hard to make any progress. I think he's an optimist. I think the biggest single risk we face in cybersecurity is we don't even know what it is. Of course, not knowing doesn't deter lots of people from prescribing <clears throat> solutions. What do you think? If we've got a monitoring surveillance system, something to detect threats, what do you think is the most important attribute of a system like that? What's the most important thing you could know about it? I didn't get this answer either. So you want to regale us? I'm waiting for somebody to offer something. What is the most important attribute of a monitoring or surveillance system? I've got a sensor right here. And I, what? Geolocation? Geolocation is helpful. It's helpful, but, but it's not the sensor. Uh, what about the what sensor? What about it? Is it actually recording? And is it like accurate? Well, well it, it's it's accurately recording what it sees. That's a good. So, so you're assuming that it's working. If and you're, you assume that it sees everything. If if you're working for an agency that creates, or let's say, orbits spy satellites. And the bad guys are willing to do that? pay you a whole lot to give them some technical specs on those satellites. What's the most important thing they want to know? What Facts. they can't detect. Okay? Which means that no direct measurement of how well it's doing what it's designed to do no direct measurement of how well it's doing what you thought it should do is sufficient. You have to estimate the likelihood of an event you've never observed. A threat you may not even be able to imagine. Can this detect what I didn't think of? Now, how are we going to do that? Uh, what can we do? Well, remember what I just said about a diverse analytical team and the diverse methods? You send a whole bunch of different solvers out there, and if one of them hits, you produce more of them? It may be that the threat you're seeing is something you've never encountered before. You don't have a solver for that. But you may have a solver that can kind of handle it, and then you try to modify that one. That means you need a deep understanding of the phenomena and the systems we're considering Oversimplified metrics end up misleading you. And those, I don't think there's anybody in this room except me and Russ, and maybe Rob, old enough to remember body counts from Vietnam. You don't even have to remember that. You just have to remember the Iraq War at the time of the IED um, explosion, right? And, and that's a double on top. Mm -hmm. When IEDs came on board, Jack Keane went to to Peter Pace and said, you're losing this war. You need to form a council of colonels. And what he meant by that Peter is Peter Pace was, was uh, chief of staff army at the time, right? Or, or was uh, Pace was chairman? chairman of the Joint chairman Chiefs. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, okay. Okay, so he got 16 people together, four from every service, four Marines, four Army, four, um, four Air Force and four Navy at the 06 level which is equivalent to captain in the Navy or, or a colonel. And they looked at the problem for three months and they came up with what the real problem was. And it was, we were measuring the wrong thing. And once they figured out that we were measuring the wrong things, they said, how do we measure the right things and which things were we surprised by? And after that, if you read the book by Peter Mansour called Surge, You'll, you'll figure out exactly what we did after that. Continue. In Tom Rick's book, The Gamble, which was the second of his books about Iraq, talked about the surge and the, the change of strategy. Ray Odierno, who had been a corps commander, goes back as theater commander. He calls up this little half-pint female British peace activist by the name of Emma Skye. 
says, I'm going back to Iraq and I'd like you to come on board with me as my political advisor. She said, why in the world would either of us want that? You know I thought everything you were doing was BS. He said, that's why. It, it takes a strong but wise person to invite people on your staff that have different opinions. But it is one of the best things you can do. I once won a competition where the admin assistant, the 19-year-old admin assistant that I thought wasn't going to help us at all, turned out to be the difference between us winning the competition and us being in second place. And it turns out that her father was a NASA scientist. <laughs> and, and she helped us solve two problems that I, couldn't, that I didn't know enough to solve. You never know. You just never know. There was a study many, many years ago somebody did of who in the therapeutic team was best at predicting how well a person who'd had serious mental illness would do. So they had the MD psychiatrist, they had the counseling psychologist, they had the occupational counselor, they had the, there, there was another person involved, and they threw in the psychiatrist receptionist as a control. Of course, you know, from the way I told the story, the psychiatrist receptionist turned out to be the most accurate predictor. Because all she saw was whether they did things like keep appointments on time. And that's what most of the world sees. All right. So one of the other things we can do is we look for indirect metrics. If you have a run-down, horrible neighborhood in the middle of a high crime area, and that's a very low crime district, that's probably where the bad guys are sleeping. What do people do when they see police or military patrol approaching? Good, hi, or ignore you. Bad, they sort of vanish. Do they tell you where the bad guys are? If they're not telling you where the bad guys are, they're probably telling them where you are. So this is something you can look at. If Absence of proof is not proof of absence, but absence of evidence is often evidence of absence. If, for example, you want to do surveys in a place like Afghanistan, which means you hire locals who know the language, the most important information you can get is where they'll never go. Those are the areas that are under ad adversary control. You don't have to do any surveys to figure that one out. If, now I haven't checked the uh, names lately. These were fictitious the last time I checked. If in Fredonia you are hearing reports that the Ugalaps, they used to have pretty good demographic statistics, you're hearing some vague reports that the Ugalaps might be in trouble, and all of a sudden Fredonia doesn't have good statistics about where the Ugalaps live. And if they're dying, what they're dying from, that is your number one footprint at the start of a human rights campaign of violations. This was a, uh, this chapter with that idea in it started off the best human rights training, monitoring training program in the world. Herb Spirer trained. Most of the people doing statistical human rights monitoring in the world now were trained by Herb Spirer or by someone who trained at Columbia. So you know, look for the holes. The thing that isn't there may be much more informative than the thing that is. And where that Samuelson and Spirer article came from was uh, an editorial review on another article where a very good political scientist was claiming you can't do anything because as soon as a government gets oppressive, it starts suppressing the data. And one of the review panel said, well, you know, when you do consumer credit scoring, if they won't tell you where they work, that's not missing at random. That's a really important piece of information. I wonder if something like that would work here. So another thing we can do is we can use war games. You can get a better understanding of, of what somebody who knew your plans could do to you. And if you knew they were going to do that, what could you do to them? it's best to express both the inputs and outputs rather than trying to get them into some nice quantitative form that's easier to analyze later. Do storytelling. 
we have text processing in computers now. We can make structure out of uh, verbal data, just narrative data. You can do things like count how many of the stories people told contained a particular term. In the an analysis that was done in Argentina after the Dirty War, there were these accounts of people having been disappeared. And what somebody noticed after a while was that many of these accounts contained a reference to a green Ford Falcon. Green Ford Falcon turned out to be the unofficial official car of one of the paramilitary groups. So if, it, if the last thing they saw was somebody being bundled into a green Ford Falcon by two or three big nasty looking guys, it was that group. And they were able to start making the connections. This is the kind of analysis we need to do to do cybersecurity effectively. Yeah, it's daunting. It's not easy. But it's overwhelming, and what do we do when we're overwhelmed? We tend to do more of what we know. We retreat to our comfort zone. And this can often take the form of constructing a fairly complex, elaborate system of processes and credentials, and then insisting that all events and contingencies be filtered through that system. Those of you who were here right before the talk heard one manifestation of that. We don't have anyone authorized to speak officially about that topic. You can't talk about it. Which means, of course, if you follow that instruction, you can't hear anybody's reaction to it either. Does this help? Is this productive? No, you run into this. The things that hurt you most are the things you think you know that ain't so. So what we need to do is focus on possibilities rather than figuring out who our adversaries probably are and then figuring out what their intentions probably are. You tell your red player, you be whoever you want and do whatever you want. Just look for a way to mess everything up. And then your adjudication in a war game, your white cell, says, okay, red cell, you said that you're going to flap your arms and fly and penetrate the fortress that way. That's not physically possible. We're going to forbid that move. But if you've got one of those rocket belts and you can get that across the wall without being detected and shot down, we may let you do that. Even the wildest scenarios, the things you think couldn't possibly happen, and what would happen if they tried, you get from the game, that's a reportable finding. Oh, they did this. We don't think this is possible, but if they did this, we'd be in trouble. We'd better make sure they can't do this. One of the most famous war games of all time was Millennium Challenge 2000, where um, Paul Van Riper, Marine General, came up with two ingenious ways to sink the carrier in the task force. The second one involved little boats coming in with explosives, and it turns out that there was no weapon aboard the carrier whose firing level would depress enough to hit a small boat approaching. Carriers are kind of tall. Turned out the most effective defensive weapon you could have aboard a carrier was a couple of squads of marine riflemen. So, you know, little boats approaching, you shoot them. But you have to have something that can shoot downward. Okay, so you note that. All right, we learned something. And you go on, you reset the game, and you replay. And you try to persuade the admirals who wanted to take Van Riper out and shoot him in the parking lot not to do that. He was a Marine, by the way. Oh, he absolutely. And if you don't know the culture, I was in a, a wargaming seminar some time ago when somebody said, I think there's an unwritten rule in the Marine Corps that you can't make 06 without having told the Navy admiral to go pound sand comes a voice from the back of the room, that's not folklore. We're taught that in OCS. <laughs> <laughs> the Marines are still mad at the Navy for not giving them more support at Guadalcanal. We're all on the same team, but...
Once a year, the Army-Navy game, the Marines were all rooting for Navy. The rest of the time, we can't even assume we know who the bad guys are. How do we know they're guys? How do we know they're human? They might not even be human or instructed by humans. We don't know. One of the things you have to think about is that the next attack will be biological and it'll be something that evolved naturally. There's a swarm intelligence there, but there's no human involved. Yeah, bad guys might not even be guys. It's, it's playing a funny way. We also can't assume that the bad guys aren't us. And this is not insider threat. It's it's that we have these we have these zero day we have these zero day defects. There is no one, such thing as a piece the, of code that is perfect. One of the biggest threats is our own mistakes. A real good example occurred in January of 1990. AT&T upgraded their software for picking routes for long-distance calls. And one of the things they had in there was if a route becomes so congested that it's not a good choice, just stop considering it. What they neglected to add was after an hour or two, you might want to look again. <laughs> they brought down the entire long-distance system of the country for a day. It's a one-line fix. But, oops! We have met the enemy, and they is us. Lots of times. Which ought to make you really nervous about these folks over uh, not too far from here. Talking about how we're going to have AI and automation and all of, of this wonderful mechanization and automation that's going to be smarter than humans and protect us from threats. Who's going to tell it how to do that? And how are the blind spots in whoever tells it not going to get into the autonomous systems? Now, a war game, I, I mentioned a war game. A war game doesn't have to be highly structured. It doesn't have to be one of these things like a Title X game where they spend four months telling the red team exactly what it can and cannot do. Very informal games are, are, can be very informative. <coughs> The difference between that and just a bunch of folks sitting around talking, a bunch of guys sitting around talking, box set, is that there is adjudication. There's a result. There are consequences. There's an assessment of how it went. This was good, this was bad. And you know, you may have assessments that other things could have happened. But it's not just, okay, we had a nice conversation, that's nice, let's all go home, put down some findings that pretty much represent what we thought at the end, but there's no independent you know, you guys came to a consensus that isn't really that good. You want that. And when you do that, the rapporteurs, the people who are collecting all the comments and all the discussions, and what were the transactions that took place at every move of the game, those people are critical. One of the common mistakes in war game design is that that's where you put your newbies. Oh, you go be a rapporteur, so you'll learn something about the game. Uh-uh. We want experienced people there because they know what to pick up on and what was important about what was said. And this is a connection to big data. Because as soon as you start processing narratives, text processing narratives and extracting meaning from them, you're in big data and you're trying to derive as much as you can from an overwhelming amount of verbiage the same analytical process works for big data outputs as for more gaming. What do we know? How do we know it? What are the alternatives? What is this telling us? Are there patterns? How consistent are the data we have? And that brings us to how is there a more structured and formal way to look at the what ifs to project out what if, and if we responded to that, how would that work, and then what might they do in return to that. And the formal theory that projects out that way of thinking is called hypergame theory. I am happy to introduce my learned colleague here who will tell you a little bit about it. 
Thank you, Doug. Okay, so let's let's just start off with the basics. Has anyone here heard of game theory? Okay, you've heard nope. of game theory. <laughs> so what is game theory? Game theory is a mathematical approach to figuring out, if you know what the outcomes and the strategies are, it's to figure out what the strategy mix is that gives you the best outcome or gives you essentially um, an insured an insured expected value. The problem is the game theory doesn't consider what if someone has one strategy that you don't know? What if they just have one strategy that you don't know? You actually can't use game theory to solve that problem. And in, in less than five slides, I'll tell you what adding a strategy that you don't know about will do to your answer. But let's just look at this thing the way that anybody looks at it. First of all, how many things can you, how many complex futures can you keep in your head at the same time? Okay, if I told you the story of Goldilocks, but I gave you five different versions of the story of Goldilocks, would you be able to remember them all? Probably not. Any complex story be, starts to reduce your span. You might be able to remember if I put 12 digits out here, and most people can't, the Miller number is seven plus or minus two. Hmm. But if I put out seven digits out here, most everyone in this room could remember all seven digits. If I told you seven Goldilocks stories, you'd only be able to remember three. Yeah. Okay? So therefore, we start off with the idea that maybe we should come up with a mechanism so we can start recording multiple stories so if we have to recall them, we can. And it's called a table. And the table starts off with what, what opportunities are we thinking over here, what are our possible plans, and what could nature or an adversary do as columns. And the whole purpose of it is to, catch a to capture a narrative of what the enemy or nature's doing it could be a great big storm comes in and we have this plan to go visit our sister or something like that and we can't do it. So you take what you're currently planning to do, you take the current situation and, and this is everybody does this and they say um, I'm gonna go to school on Monday. <laughs> but you're gonna go to school on Monday unless someone kidnaps you. So what you do is you go and you say, well, is there a way we can improve going to school on Monday? And if you think of one, then you say, how can we do better? How much better would we do? And then is there a way to break that? This is the key. Remember this. There are no dominant algorithms. There are no dominant plans. There is no plan that works in all situations to give the best result over all other plans. Does anybody disagree with that? Okay. Well, there is, but, the, just to be technical about it, in, in game theory, there is the folk theorem. Yes. Yeah. What, what the folk theorem says is that there is a class of, uh, in essence, strategies, right? Yeah. Which can, uh, which can guarantee the outcome that you desire as the, as the, as the, as the designer of your, of your strategy space. And basically, it has to, those all have to do with some kind of extreme, uh, you know, the extreme. Uh, but none of those plans are, are, do are dominant. None of those plans are such that the row, that the row that, that has the plan, has better numbers than any other row. I'm saying, you know, in, in what the folk theorem says, the folk theorem says that it's, it's a technical point. The folk theorem says that you can, that there, there is this class of strategies in repeated games, right? Which is that, which is that basically they have they have to do with incredible threats, right? I say you better cooperate with me for the rest of for, from now on. Yes. Otherwise, if you detect on me once, yeah. I will pull the nuclear lever. Right. 
Okay. And so and, that thing has. Those, but that's a mix yeah. of points. Yeah. No, that's, that, 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 I'm saying that, that's, that's one strategy that, that, is, that is believed to be, but that, that will always. But anyway, it's, it's just that it's, that's, not, it's not used in practice, typically. But it's, right. It's and it, and, but it is a mix of strategies. Because it, it, it could I'm be a single strategy. Until I do that. Well, it, it could be a single strategy. The point is, you have to have a course of action in there that is dominant, and in most games you don't. So it is possible to have one that is. So, so here's what you discover if you go and you look at that algorithm. What you discover is that there's an inherent cooperation. It's actually not zero sum because if we agree mutually assured destruction. We agree not to blow each other up. We've had all this, these contests since 1949 when yep. the Soviets got their nuclear weapons, and none of us have exchanged nuclear weapons. But I will tell you, in the 50s, the United States made organizations that were called pentomic divisions. They were planning to throw weapons at nuclear weapons mm -hmm. as the answer. So when you have inherent cooperation, the really good thing about that is you agree that you're only get, you agree to bound the world only this far. So when someone says, if I'm going to bound my bound my world by not going past this point, essentially what you've got is you've got an agreement to not do the strategy that they call for in that Philip Alvin. There was such an agreement about chemical weapons in World War II. Yeah, there was. You can't trust the Nazis to do much, but you could trust them to abide by the Geneva Conventions on Weaponry. And, and the Germans did all sorts of bad things, and the Americans were ready to use weapons, as I'm sure others were. And the British. And the British, but More they so. never did. Well, Russ, so, before I continue, a question yeah. for the professor. I want to make sure I heard you correctly, sir. Did you say folk with an F or Polk well, with it, a B. It's, it's, called, yeah, it's called the Polk theorem. In Polk with an F. So it's only for repeated games. It's called Polk because you know she, when Shapley and Schubert and all those guys who were there at the birth of game theory, they said that they all knew it. They, they all, they all, you know, once again, the solution to a repeat. Oh, everybody. A, knew a, it. That's a strategy to a repeated game yeah. is typically not just a repetition of a strategy to a single shot game, right? Right. And, and so the, these the, these extreme strategies of uh, right. basically. You basically say, uh, yeah. you, know, you put in a, an extreme trigger strategy, they're called. This is a class of folk yes. strategy. Yes, okay. folk with an F. And, and that was also in Schelling's, uh, one, one of the, I think it's strategy, strategy conflict, one of, one of his works on deterrence, where he said that uh, it is actually advantageous in some negotiations to have a possible course of action that would be so disastrous everybody's going to avoid it because then there will be implicit agreement not to <coughs> take the risk of going there. Right. And, 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 that, and that's good. Um, uh, America decided not to continue with their pentomic divisions because they ended up designing weapons <laughs> that had burst radiuses bigger than their throw, <laughs> weight, their throw distance. <laughs> So if they had a weapon that had a five kilometer radius and only shot the weapon two and a half kilometers, they realized there was going to be collateral damage. The, the folklore about those divisions, the, the people in them, uh, non-coms in them said, you know, if you fire a Davy Crockett at somebody, Davy Crockett was our, our little tactical uh, missile. Missile, or actually I think it was fired from a recoilless rifle. No, it wasn't. Projectile. It was fired. It, we didn't have miniaturization in those days. It was a big old lumbering thing that was fired off of essentially a little launch pad. Anyhow, if you fire one of those things at somebody, you have two certain kills, your target and yourself. Right. <laughs> so, so the idea is, okay, this is, where, this is where most people stop. They figure that they're a little fish in a big pond. That is, if I change my behavior and I do this, I can do better in the stock market. And what they don't do is they don't say, well, can someone exploit this strategy? And if they can exploit the strategy, how bad can they make the outcome? And this is, a lot of game theorists talk about avoiding the outguessing problem because decision theory is about what? It's about maximizing your return. Game theory is 
to try to maximize your return without maximizing your exposure. So you minimize your exposure while you maximize your gain. How bad they, can they make the outcome? Then what you do is you say, can we repair this outcome? How much better do we think we could do if we repair this outcome? And then you continue. Continue with your next slide. We can use hypergame theory to help non-human red team players test their security next. So what happens is, if we keep doing this, if we do this, how could they or nature beat it? And then how could we beat that? What you do is you descend down the diagonal of this game, of this table. And you have, if we do this and they do this, if we do this and they do this, if we do this and they do this, you get down to the point where, repeatedly, until next, until we find one of two conditions. These are the stopping conditions for the algorithm. We get the Mobius answer. What's the Mobius strip answer? Turns out that one of the previous strategies ends up being the next best strategy. So one of the previous enemy things ends up being a, a column, ends up having a, one of the best answers to your next row. That's the Mobius answer. And now what you've got is you've got a not exactly a convex hull, but what you do have is you do have a bounded space. Or you find something that they won't do because there's a proclivity. And if there's a proclivity, the moment you discover it, you can do a feint. What is a feint? A feint is where you pretend to do something that you're not actually going to do. So the moment that you find you, so you can go down here, and even if it doesn't close one way, you can close it because of the mechanisms that they'll choose in their columns, and you can add a row which makes you look like you're doing one thing when you're actually doing something else. Next. So these proclivities for us, are they rooted in... History, They're usually wrote it in, 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 in politics, uh, economics, societal, information, infrastructure. I mean, it, it's, it's usually something, it's like um, somebody did a great study on Germans and Russians in World War II. And they discovered the Germans were wonderful on the attack and the Russians were great on the defense. And they found out that the problem was is that the Germans lost heart when they were defending, not when they were counterattacking. As long as they could do mobile counterattacks, as long as they could jib and jab and do counterstrikes, they were fine. The moment that they had lost and all they could do is a trip back, they actually lost faster than was predicted by their combat experiences. Another, that, another that Trevor Dupuy did that. Another problem they had was that their big advantage was mobile warfare, and they had a huge advantage in communication. They had a lot more radios than the Russians. So as long as you're doing mobile warfare, the guys with better communications have a huge advantage. When they're defending a fixed position, that advantage goes away. Right. But that, but that's that's just that's an example. It doesn't prove anything. It just it just shows that the, the kind of proclivity that we're talking about. Yeah. Next. So this thing gets bigger and bigger until you finally either get it to do a Mobius wrap, or you find that that you're likely in the Iraq campaign of the first. Of the yeah. first Gulf War. Sorry, let me just turn that off. Um, in the first Gulf campaign, it turns out that there's a book called Zones of Control by MIT Press. My article is right after Schelling's article. And what I do is I show that the Americans considered six attack plans and that the feint by the by the uh, Marines against the coast of Iraq was very important to tie down the Republican Guard so that you could slice across the desert. Anyway, 
we need to assess the off diagonals to find side effects about robustness. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, you've already got a good answer here, and you've got a bad answer here. Remember, every one of these rows is going to have something that says, yeah, you could do really well, but this is the anti-plan, or you could do really badly. So why do you need to look at the cross at the diagonals? Why do you, I mean, pass the diagonals and look at these others? Because this could be good, 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 bad, good, good. At which point, it's a pretty robust plan. Because no matter what actually happens, there's only one situation where it goes bad. And that's how you figure out the robustness. If it's bad, good, bad, 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 good, bad, that's a less robust plan. And that's how you can figure out the robustness of your plan. You actually, and this forces your brain to go places it won't normally go. Because if it's one thing for me to say, if I do this and they do this, they will do well. It's another thing to say, if I do this and they do this other thing that's not actually related to what I'm doing, but doing it for their own reasons, what's that result? Does anybody see that? Have I made myself clear? You're forcing, your, by forcing yourself to say, what happens if I use plan six against enemy column two? To make this really clear, you might need another hour. Right, but okay. The, the overview not. is that there is a method based yes. on hypergains that enables you to, to discard a lot of non-robust courses of actions and concentrate on the good ones. Right, it's actually a dis, uh, it's it's one of the dissertations that is actually in your in, in your library, um, and uh, then what you're doing is you're looking for every row because remember this is a, I mean column every column you don't have control over but you do have control over one thing. This is back to sensing. You do know if they did this, these are the kinds of things that we would see. And so then what you're doing is you're trying to make sure that the really bad thing, you're not seeing any evidence that they're doing those kinds of things. And that, that picks up your capability to model your opponent. Next. I think that's your last one. I think it is. So hypergame theory, basically you generate a whole bunch of games. That's it. Next. All right. So hypergames can help you determine the value of outguessing the opponent. <clears throat> oh, this is mine. It is. Yeah, it is. So every new column cannot increase the value of the game. In other words, if you add a column, the game value to the row player will not increase. But you're doing that to just make sure that you're not fooling yourself. You literally are adding things, bad things that might happen. But if it's not bad enough, then they won't ever use it. The same thing is with a row. If you add a row, the Nash equilibrium value for that game will not be reduced. So it's the exact opposite. I don't guarantee that it will go up. I just guarantee that it won't go down. And we always challenge every plan with an anti-plan to ensure more objectivity. But none of us is going to be completely objective. We just can't do it. But there, it's, it's, it's a tilt at objectivity. And all this game theoretic, decision theoretic approach allows us. And most of my stuff is published in like AAMAS, Autonomous Agents and Multi-Agent Systems, Decision Theoretic, Game Theoretic Agents. And it's essentially an, a, a way to do selection that's not a POM VP, Partially Observable Markov Decision Process. That's it. So. What we get from this is a better idea of the value of information. How much better a decision could we make if we knew more? If we had perfect information, how much better could we do? How can we acquire the most valuable information? And this comes from Hubbard. Usually, the most valuable information you can get is in the area you know least about. One data point where you know nothing gives you a lot. One more data point where you know a lot doesn't give you much more. And getting a good decision quickly is usually much better than a demonstrably excellent decision way, way later at much greater cost. 
So it's good to have an idea of what, what two or three pieces of information might I be able to collect fairly soon that would drastically improve my outcome. Hypergame theory helps you illuminate that. And in the kind of pattern recognition we're going to be doing, looking for anomalies, looking for holes, looking for data that are too nice. One of the other things Herb Spirer did one time was he uh, caught some people who were faking quality data in a manufacturing process. They knew enough to fake randomness, but they didn't know enough to fake that it had to have or should have a nearly normal distribution. So even faking randomness was smart. What, what often happens is when faking, when people are faking data, it's too good. There's not enough variation there. There are no anomalies. There are no outliers. That ain't real. Not usually. So, for example, if, if you're looking at an insider threat, somebody did a little extra copying in the late evening in the copy room. Well, okay, it's not all that important. Somebody did some mildly unusual foreign travel. A person who hadn't traveled much decided he really wanted to see St. Petersburg three times in a year. <laughs> well, yeah, it's an interesting place. Uh, maybe the, uh, you see a modest change in their financial situation, one direction or the other. That's not a big deal. But you put those three things together, same person, same year, that's a person of interest. It's this kind of subtle pattern recognition that we need to do in cybersecurity. Um, this one site keeps kind of pinging us and getting information from some of our not very sensitive but mildly sensitive areas. And they seem, it, it seems that same site has pinged our log file a couple of times. Maybe what they're doing is sizing us up for whether they can spoof the log file to cover a major penetration. You look at things like that. So how hard is the problem of minimizing cyber risk? It has been suggested only partially tongue-in-cheek that there are three classes of problems. It's a Mount Everest problem. You know where the peak is. You just have to figure out how to get there. The South Pole problem is harder. You don't know quite where it is from where you're standing. But you'll know how to recognize when you're there. And you'll have a way of recognizing whether you seem to be getting closer. Then there's the Marianas Trench problem. Find the deepest point in the ocean. The only way you can do that is to list all the possible candidates and evaluate them. Those are the hardest problems. Which do you think this is? Yeah. Yeah, and even then, it is possible to determine, there's an even harder class of problems, it is possible to determine that there is a deepest point in the ocean. You list all the candidates and compare them, and one of them's the deepest. I don't know that you know what the minimized cybersecurity risk even looks like. The explosion of state space that Russ was talking about right before the talk applies with a vengeance here. So what you have to do is settle for a pretty good solution. You stop searching when the expected value of improvement is less than the expected cost of attaining anything better. And in cost of improvement, you better factor in the possibility of unintended destructive changes. Oh, I just changed a little bit of code, and now I introduced a bigger problem than what I was trying to prevent. Measurement is uncertain at best. Definition is uncertain at best. But the main idea is if you keep thinking the way you've always thought, you monitor the way you've always monitored, you design your system according to the best principles you've already developed, you're going to get too comfortable there are a lot of folks in the national security establishment who have guzzled a lot of the snake oil from our friends at Carnegie Mellon about capability maturity models. Capability maturity, going from step one to step two, going from chaos to somewhat organized, going from organized to more designed, two to three, those are good steps. 
many organizations that have gone that far have improved by doing so. You get past a certain point. How many, I, I don't know how many of you know about CMM? Okay, not a lot. The people I know who know more about it than I do can list very few organizations that ever attained level five. And one of the reasons for that is that it can be very difficult to distinguish the difference between level five and rigor mortis. They've got so much process. They've got so much formality. There are so many things you can't do. They've driven all the innovation out of the organization. And for something like cybersecurity protection, I hope we've convinced you, if nothing else, that a diverse team, maybe including non-human elements, doing all kinds of innovation, and then doing something like hypergame theory to narrow the search space and say, here are the courses of action that seem most promising, and go with that, that's the way to do it. Because, Tom Schelling's name came up earlier, Nobody can make a list of all the things he never imagined. And the things we never imagined are the ones that are, that are going to get us. The only thing you can do about that is bring more imaginations into the team. So we need to expand the way we think about vulnerabilities and possible response. We need to generate a diversity of players and a variety of solver approaches and skill sets and try them, preferably in simulation, because for most of the kinds of problems we're talking about, you can't do a real-life real life validation experiment. Many of the validation experiments you could do, you'd never get past the Human Subjects Committee or some of the other folks who monitor what, what kind of experimentation gets done. You have to elicit creative adversary actions and then look at what you could do about them and what would they do if you did that. Use things like a hyper game theory based approach to expand what we consider and evaluate our options because this is from about 1969 and it's still true. The greatest threat to our society. Hello. The greatest threat to our security is inertia in the thinking of those responsible for our security. You can have these slides, I'm going to give you a copy. After this one, there are about five pages of references, which you might want to have. Fifty-nine, no, sorry, fifty-seven minutes. Are we good or are we good? <laughs> Time for a few questions. Anybody have any questions? I've got a question for Doug. So, Doug, what happens in an organization where you have these two forces of meeting one another? One camp wants to aggressively bring in more imaginations into the team, like you, like you said, while the other camp consists of the leadership of the organization that's more concerned about pretending to be someone they're not. What do you do in a situation like that? In industry, if you have the choice, you go join a competitor they regard with particular hostility and who regards them with particular hostility, and they learn the hard way that their approach is wrong. If the organization is something like a very high-level component of the U.S. Department of Defense, and constructing a rival could be a very uh, undesirable course of action, what you have to do is look for a patron who can give you top cover in another part of the organization and do whatever you can to advance that patron's success. So Congress set that up for many years with the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. the, the organization was called Net Assessments. And Net Assessments went to Congress and basically talked about the programs that were in the Department of Defense and where their holes were. Was that for Penn Adventures? It was uh, called uh, Net, Net uh, Assessment. Net Assessment, yeah. And it was, was, a guy, it was run by a guy named Andy Marshall, and he Andy ran Marshall. it until he was about 84 or so. And Congress had specifically set it up 
because of that. If you actually read the literature now coming out of the Army War College, they actually recognize that they wouldn't have been able to solve the Iraq problem and other problems that have happened since if they didn't have more of what they're calling a design view, mm -hmm. which spends more time thinking about the problem before coming up with an answer. There's um, a lot of operators rush to an answer because that's how they got promoted to, as operators. It's, uh, and, and it's, I mean, it's the thing that the Russians complained about. They, they said, when we get our generals, they always follow orders. This was in the 80s. Uh, we, we, can't gen we, can't, we don't have any colonels who we haven't basically beat the innovation out of. And so therefore, when we need a Marshal Zhukov, well, Zhukov was, existed prior to the communist army. And so he was already an out, he was a cavalry officer, and cavalry officers operate independently in front of a bunch of forces, and they do their own thing. And so therefore, he was a great field marshal. The book Tom Ricks wrote after the gamble was The Generals in which he made pretty much the same case about the United States military. You get people to go get along by going along up to staff college appointment. And then you say, okay guys, now you have to see the big picture and think out of the box, and you've been beating that out of them for 20 years. What do you do? But it, it's, it's really always going to be about trust. Um, when you have two cultures collide, um, when Pasteur ran into the culture of, you know, that there are no germs, and you can use forceps, and you can be working on a cadaver, and then you can be delivering a baby, um, inevitably, really, the only thing that works is when you get better results. You see the same thing in elementary schools pretty much every year. A brand new crop of new teachers comes in, <laughs> and they've been told the latest and greatest theory. And the master teachers know more about diagnosis, but they don't know the latest tools. So things like using the Khan Academy or something like that to boost people's mathematics isn't in their wheelhouse. But if their kids start scoring, if the young teachers who aren't good at diagnosing what the kids' capabilities are, are getting start getting better results than the master teacher, then they start being willing to co collaborate. And, it, and trust doesn't come easily, it comes with time. What can just as easily happen, though, is that a senior administrator comes in there who's drunk all the Kool-Aid from the latest theories. Oh, that's and these, these that's old fuddy-duddies are in the way. We're going to put new folks in there oh, that know the all the right thing. buzzwords. And the school system declines dramatically, and somebody finally looks at it and says, "What's going wrong here?" And the teachers' union explains it to them, and you get a new supervisor, a new, new superintendent, a new principal. Sure. But it takes a while. One of my great heroes in life is Seymour Codman. Seymour Codman was a brilliant young surgeon around the turn of the 20th century at Mass General Hospital, which means Harvard Medical School. He came up with the bright idea that maybe surgeons and other medical personnel should be evaluated and promotion be determined by how well their patients did, <laughs> and rather than by seniority, which is what had been done. You blasphemous. And he came, oh, you have, you don't know the half of it. He came up, he invented a big chunk of what we now think of as medical outcomes analysis. He was brilliant. He came up with a bunch of ways to assess, here are the right metrics, to assess how well somebody's doing. His metrics were in fact so good that after they drove him out of the school, they adopted some of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for your kind attention. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the um, robustness checking and hypergame theory. <coughs> sure. So, I don't understand why that's useful if you have an opponent who is systematically selecting for the bad outcomes. Like if you have 10 possible good outcomes and one possible bad outcome, 
but someone's pushing you towards the bad one, yeah. your probability of landing there is not one in 11. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I didn't say, okay. Absolutely. So, um, very good point. I'll send you my email address, and what we'll do is we'll correspond. You're absolutely right. If you find that people are, are out thinking you, yeah. here's a note to self. If you're finding that people are out thinking you, hypergame theory won't save you. <laughs> right? If, if, the, if, if your opponent is smarter than you, wiser than you, and more clever, then coming up with a way to talk about what they might do isn't going to help you because they're going to invent a column that you will still not have. Or if. Your opponent is not that much smarter than you are, but he's reading your email. <laughs> and, and that's one of the things that I usually challenge. Uh, I've run 250 tabletop exercises um, in the last, say, out of the last 10 years. And in those, I, I frequently said, now what if there's a mole in your organization and they actually have your battle plan? How would you know that? And often, there is a way to know that. Yeah. And that's why you look for differentiating evidence for those different columns. And if you see something that really strongly signals that they're probably playing the one that you didn't want them to play, then, um, then that's an indication they might even have your battle. Yeah. yeah. There's a rather famous or infamous story about how the British had intel that the next cover, the next target for a big German air raid was going to be Coventry. They decided not to defend it in an unusual way because they were afraid that if they were waiting for the Germans at Coventry, the Germans would figure out somehow they know what we're going to do. Have they broken our code? Which of course they had. You don't want to tip to them that we've broken their code. We might need that little surprise for a bigger occasion. Okay, let's thank our speakers. If anybody's looking for an interesting uh, line of research, I, I think some of this work with uh, organizational choice is, is fascinating. And there's code that's there that somebody could play with. And of course, there's hypergame theory, and there's code for that. Thank you all.